these days, increasingly in my teaching, I'm using less and less Taoist terminology. Um, or rather, I'm not getting, I'm trying not to get too caught up in their models and, and things like this. Um, and part of the reason for that is because I feel that as a conceptual framework, a framework for study, uh, Taoism has been uh, marvelous, has been very, very good. But something I noticed was that it's a funny thing with, with the Taoist framework. And I'm aware this is definitely going to be my personal experience rather than, you know, an absolute across the board. But my personal experience was that with regards to studying the, the not Taoist philosophy so much, but more the sort of um, the sort of models of alchemy and the models of mind, the models of spirit and enlightenment and Chinese medicine theory and things like this. This whole paradigm of Taoism is highly complex. And now, what my personal experience of it is is that the Taoist framework, the Taoist model, can give marvelous clarity when you first start out. I I think Taoism, along with Buddhism, provides you know, a, a very structured, very coherent, I would argue more than Buddhism. I tell you why, why more than Buddhism, because I feel that Taoism encapsulates the body um, a lot more effectively within its teachings, whereas Buddhism is very much to do with the mind and psychology, and then beyond that, obviously, beyond psychology into um, sort of higher spiritual aspects or, or, or through to the you know, the truth of the illusion of mind or whatever, you know, but, but it's, it's focused very much on the sort of non-corporeal aspect of who you are. Whereas Taoism is very focused on the body and the channels as well as the mind. So I think that Taoism, very much for beginners, can give a great sense of clarity. So when I look at people who practice Qigong or Chinese medicine or Tai Chi or meditation, those who don't have a really good grasp of Taoism at the beginning, certainly within the Chinese arts anyway, if they don't have a good grasp of the sort of Taoist cosmological model of life, I can see that they flounder a little bit. They're a little bit woolly, um, not always of course, but often there's a tendency towards a little bit of wooliness, a bit of vagueness, a lack of clarity around some parts of the process. And generally what happens is the deeper you go into the Taoist models, especially now uh, more and more of their literature is available, more and more of their teachings have become available, more and more people speak Chinese, so you can start to understand their culture and sort of work into Taoism. It provides a, a great sense of clarity and guidance to beginners. All of a sudden, what was a very sort of vague path? Oh, right, we're going to cultivate something. We're going to open some channels. We're going to develop our body and work with chi, like <laughs> what? You know, that's very vague. It feels like stumbling in the dark at first. And then what happens is you need, alongside your practice, you need this conceptual model and Taoism is very good for that. So with respect to these kind of models, Taoism is that, especially because it was a thing I was primarily uh, trained within for a really long time as well. Um, it's the model that I use to explain to beginners and it's the one that I take even intermediate practitioners into an understanding of the sort of view of life and view of the body, a view of health and view of spirituality and how consciousness works and you know these kind of things. Taoism's models are marvelous for that. It takes away all the vagueness, delivers clarity, takes away all that fuzziness that is so prevalent um, when you first encounter these arts, you know. But then it hits a hurdle. And this is that at later stages in Taoist models, at later stages in practice, I actually find that the Taoist model or concept becomes a little bit of a hindrance. It becomes a little bit of a, a problem, something of a hurdle. Because, and again, this is subjective. And I do think that, now this is the thing. This is the argument that will arise. So let me try to head this argument off. Is I would argue, I would say that there are Taoist scholars who are going to disagree with what I say here. Is that I think that the Taoist model is inadequate beyond a certain point for spiritual cultivation. I think for beginners and intermediate level practitioners, the Taoist concepts are marvelous. Once you get past that kind of intermediate stage into the more advanced levels, if you like, or should we even, shouldn't even grade them like that, should we? It's almost like a belt system in a martial art or something. Once you go deeper into your, your study, deeper into your cultivation, um, actually the Taoist models become a little bit of a hindrance um, because they tend to focus on levels that aren't really where your focus is at in your practice. Now, this is where Taoist scholars will disagree with me because they'll say, oh no, and then they'll present this theory that's at a higher level. Now, 
to counter that, what I say is when I then see these Taoist scholars talking about the higher level practice using this models, actually, to me, they're stuck as well. Like, I've never seen a Taoist scholar successfully discuss with clarity the higher levels of Taoist training. I've seen them discuss the intermediate levels um, fairly succinctly and fairly well. I've seen them discuss the foundation levels fairly well. But I've never seen a Taoist scholar discuss the higher levels of spiritual practice very well at all. I just haven't. I've seen them think they are. I've seen them give commentary on it. But I think that now, after having studied it for this long, I have a right to an opinion. I think I do. I've never seen them go beyond the intermediate levels of, of practice, not with regards to their explanations or their understandings. And in conversations with Taoist scholars where I've spoken to them or people who are very rigidly within that with Taoist framework, um, I've never met one that I feel isn't in some way encumbered by their theory. And this is coming from someone that was really involved in Taoism for a long time. Again, subjective, I know, just giving you my view. Then. In some ways, Buddhism is the same, you know, like I think Buddhism gives a great sense of clarity, I think a greater sense of clarity, Dao Buddhist theory gives a greater sense of clarity than Taoist theory, definitely with regards to the mind. Um, I think it breaks it down and <laughs> cuts it up, if you want, like puts it under the microscope, a great deal to a far higher degree than Taoism does which to some degrees is its strength, because Buddhism then lends you a kind of conceptual framework to lead you into the non-corporeal parts of the training better than Taoism does, I would say so. But even that becomes a hurdle, because that becomes a little bit too rigid, too gradiated. Like, it's quite funny, you end up after a while, if you get involved in Buddhist theory, if you're not careful, if you go too deep into it, just like you do with any theory, I suppose, you, you start sort of labeling things immediately, and it's almost like you're dissecting or cutting up um, your process rather than really um, kind of becoming it and sort of experiencing and, and getting into this process. So it's quite funny that we need these concepts in order to provide clarity, but after a while they become a little bit of an anchor, a little bit of a hurdle. It's the same with scholarly study in general. Like scholarly study is useful to a point, but after a while you have to let it go. It's like the scholarly study, unless you're, in, unless, of course, unless you're studying history or um, you know, the theory of it, oh, fair enough, okay, but if you're a practitioner, even scholarly study becomes a, a major hurdle after a while, because once you've trained your mind to analyze and dissect to a very high level, then unfortunately it gets a little bit stuck. And again, I've had scholars of various things, not just ours, and disagree with me on this, but then when I talk to them, to me they're stuck. Um, there's something sort of lost in their study, lost in their focus. They, they are overnaming, if you want, which would be a Taoist term, we should never name the phenomena. Essentially, they're overnaming. That which can be named is not the true Tao, which doesn't mean you can't describe Tao. What it means is you can't, you shouldn't label and stratify and name every single little experience. It means your conceptual framework, your scholarly study, has become an issue. It's become a block um, on your cultivation. And then we have this amazing sort of balancing act, don't we, of timings. How to time this as a practitioner, as a cultivator, because at the beginning we need in-depth um, intellectual study. The people I've met that are just practitioners, just do, monkey see, monkey do, copy the teacher, they never get very far either, not from what I've seen. Like, maybe the occasional one, but they, they, again, they don't have the, the, the light in the darkness. So you need a little bit of that you need a certain degree, quite a high degree of theoretical study and engaging with the conceptual frameworks such as Taoism or Buddhism. But then after a while, they become a hurdle and they become a blocker. So you have to step out of them. And that's, whoa, that's, a, that's a tricky one. I was talking about it in one of the other episodes of the podcast, um, the one that I didn't do a video for, actually, because I was in a hotel somewhere. So I can't remember where I was. So it was a sound file that just went on to the apps. Talking about how once you step out of these frameworks, out of these models that become so much kind of furniture, that you're, the people who are still within those frameworks don't like it. They don't like it at all. They, they see you as a loose cannon, as a maverick, but it's an essential part of the process. I was always told early in my training that the greatest part of tradition is learning when to step out of tradition, you know, and that timing is very, very specific. Now, it's something else that I've noticed as well, just riffing around this subject, is when I've met, um, you know, when I've studied with, with teachers, uh, whether it was Wang Haitao or Shen Hung Zun or Han Ren or any of these people, Niu and Hai even to a certain extent, when I was learning off them, 
they would use concepts and frameworks, whether it was Qigong, whether it was uh, Neigong, whether it was Tai Chi, it didn't really matter, you know, whatever their subject was, they would also stick very strongly within these frameworks when they were discussing foundation or intermediate level practice, but they themselves would step out of those frameworks and out of those concepts once they started discussing anything deeper or further along in the process. And I remember when I first, I don't know, got to that level, or rather they entrusted me to that level, it was almost quite jarring, you know, like I was, I was familiar with this particular way of working, I was familiar with this framework, okay, we're using the model to explain this, this is this, and all of a sudden I was out of my comfort zone, and now it was into something that felt more vague, it was like the concept dropped away, like all of a sudden, I felt a little insecure, you know, because I, I developed these egotistical clingings to these structures that enabled my intellect to feel secure. Because even though we were discussing something around spirituality, something around internal force, something around development of chi or health on a more subtle level, it was okay because it wasn't new age, if you like, but if you like, it wasn't sort of fluffy because I had these frameworks to cling to. So it became an ego trap. Then after a while, once, once you started getting towards stages where they were ready to discuss a more advanced level, they took away the trainer wheels, if you like, and the, and the concepts and the frameworks disappeared. And all of a sudden, I'm sat there with a teacher. I remember chatting with, with Wang Haitao, and there was a, a time, a session where I sat there, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I like, I couldn't have said he was Taoist at that time. I couldn't have said he was Buddhist, or I could have said he was either. I could have said he was Hindu. Uh, if I'd walked into the room and it, it didn't know from the you know, the trimmings and the artwork and where I was in the previous study I was in, I could almost have thought he was new age. Like it was vague, like outside of those conceptual frameworks. And it was jarring. It like throws you, you know, a little bit. And then there's another level of comfort you have to, or for me anyway, this all might sound like trivia to me, but this is, to me, was a big deal because, excuse me while I drink from this ridiculous glass. To me, it was a, uh, you know, this is a big deal because I desperately wanted to understand, and to me, understanding needed a framework of some sort, especially if we're going to be able to converse on it, rather than just sit there in <laughs> some kind of, you know, psychic connection in meditation. If we were going to converse on it, then we would require um, a model to work to. So then, increasingly, what I discovered was when they are teaching at that level or that depth, however you want to word it, they would use their own words, their own experience, their own concepts, their own moral models. They would borrow from different traditions, different examples, modern contemporary examples, things like this. And then, <laughs> of course, the rebelliousness, the rebellion in me wanted to kind of stay within the concept. But increasingly, if I've gone further into my training or, or I've had to explain more complex concepts to students, then the frameworks for me have dropped away as well. My, they've dropped away for myself. So that the, the newer students with me will notice almost a very rigid adherence to Taoist or Buddhist, perhaps, um, models, conceptual models, when I'm discussing things with them. But for those who've been with me longer, I break away from those. I'm not using those anymore. I'm simply talking to them outside of the tradition, outside of the lineage, because more important than passing on a tradition at this stage, it's more about me trying to, okay, you need to understand a concept and an idea and something that we're working towards. And we can do that more successfully when we're free from the baggage of tradition. So as a kind of introductory idea, just kind of discussing this concept. And, and then within the theory, there's another problem, isn't there? And this, this is what I big, think the biggest, the biggest problem in Taoist or Chinese or yeah, just theory within Chinese arts, I would say, within Qigong, within Tai Chi, within alchemy, Nedan, or whatever, is Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine is the biggest problem. And I'll tell you why I think Chinese medicine is the biggest problem. And, and I tell my Chinese medicine students um, that I'm teaching this, and I talk to the people that I'm trying to teach Qigong to about this, and the Chinese medicine people are sometimes surprised, is that Chinese medical theory is in some ways inadequate for discussing spiritual practice because for obvious reasons it's focused on health or rather it's focused on sickness. Now I remember when I first started Chinese medical training, not the first, well, 
<laughs> first time I started Chinese medical training, medical training, I was a teenager and I was just showing practical techniques and I learned quite uh, physically, started with, with train our mass up, body work essentially, started there and, and developed. But once I started studying it in a more structured fashion as I got older, I remember one of the first lessons we were told, which sounded like a nice sound bite, but I sort of didn't agree with even at the time, was that Chinese medicine is the study of wellness, whereas Western medicine, allopathic medicine, or whatever you want to call it, is the study of sickness. And I remember, and I, and there was almost like a, a little sort of <laughs> pride within the room or something, you know what I mean? Like a little snobbery. It, it, it's almost like it's trying to establish a little snootiness in you. It's like, oh yes, those silly surgeons and doctors, they study sickness, but we really study wellness. So you kind of have that idea. And I, I kind of kept that. I remember hearing that. And then it wasn't long after I realized that's not true. Like when you're studying Chinese medicine, you're also studying sickness. You're still studying the same because you're studying, um, although you have an idea of what wellness is, we know what we want someone to um, achieve, although my definition of wellness might be different from someone else's. But we have a good idea of what health is. But you still study sickness. You still study illness, you study the nature of stagnation, the nature of deficiency, the nature of excess, the nature of conditions at the level of the blood, if you want, or the thermal properties or things. You're still studying well, unwellness. You're studying the nature of somebody when they're not in balance, when they're not in harmony. So it's not that different from Western medicine in, in that sense, I don't think. So you, you study Chinese medicine at this level and you study all the things that are wrong with someone. I mean, even if you look at the kind of Yellow Emperor's Classic, um, the Neijing, and when you read that, I mean, they're discussing people who are ill. That's what they're discussing. Most of the chapters. I mean, you could arguably, you know, Su Wen chapter one, if you, you know the book is a little different, but a lot of the rest of it is about the study of sickness and illness. When your patient is like this, when the blood is doing this, it means that pain will be there. When there is a headache, it can be there. It, it's the study of sickness. So as, as conceptual models of becoming healthy go, it's a funny old sentence, as conceptual models of becoming healthy go, Chinese medicine is a pretty good one. Like I, I like it. I find it very thorough. Um, I find it very deep, definitely, for sure. And one of its great beauties is it's also very accessible because, and this is where its strength and its weakness comes from, is certainly there is a lot more literature on Chinese medicine, I would say definitely in English, than there is on alchemy or spirituality from a Chinese perspective. I think that's safe to say. Yeah, there's a, you, you walk into a, a book, you might get a whole series of, of books on Taoism or meditation, or even on Chan Buddhism or something like that, but the Chinese, Chinese medicine literature is massive. Now, a lot of it's the same, I'll be honest. <laughs> a lot of it's quite repetitive, but there is a lot written about it. And because I think Chinese medicine permeated into our society, there was definitely a concerted effort to translate a lot more Chinese medicine literature. Um, and still now, they're translating more and more Chinese medical literature. But to be perfectly honest, when I pick it up, even you get all excited. Oh, here's a new translation to English of this book. You pick it up, you read it. There's nothing you didn't know. If, you, if you've studied to a certain level of debt, there's not really much you didn't know because it... The, the thing with Chinese literature, Chinese writing, is often it's a kind of commentary on something else. They, the Chinese have a great tradition on looking backwards and observing their roots. So <laughs> you do end up with a lot of repetitions and kind of commentaries from a later master on a, on a, a previous master's work. So there's a lot of that. Although I'm sure there's still new stuff coming out, you know. But Chinese medicine's theory is big and it's vast. Now, even in Chinese, even in Chinese, now my spoken Chinese, uh, not too bad. Uh, getting worse now I'm living in Indonesia <laughs> and gradually getting replaced with Indonesian because as a typical English person, I can only, uh, I can barely do two languages, certainly can't do three. But, but certainly at that time where I was spending a lot of time in China, my, my spoken Chinese was good, but my written Chinese was always a little, a little dodgy, so it was bad. You know, was wasn't good at all. Um, I could basically, I was at the stage at the height of my Chinese of kind of vaguely understanding what a text was about. You know, so I could, um, I took time to spend time sort of translating or converting uh, some Chinese smaller texts, Chinese into English. But it was a lengthy process uh, for me, using a lot of reference materials, and it was slow. You know, so I would never consider myself a translator at all. The translation I've done is simple, basic, and certainly double and triple checked with other people. 
But spending enough time with Chinese people and asking them about it, they would even agree that there was a lot more written in Chinese on Chinese medicine uh, than there was on alchemy or spirituality. And even a lot of the alchemy books, alchemy texts in Chinese, still concerned themselves with various levels, kind of foundational stages. Not much written about the higher stages. Scholars, again, you might disagree, but I would argue that what people are saying as advanced is actually quite intermediate. Because often what they do is they'll talk about intermediate level stages and beginning level stages. But when they talk about the advanced stuff, it's definitely more vague. It doesn't have the same level of clarity. And I want to argue that there's a far less clarity um, within Taoism discussing the sort of levels of awakening and immortality. It's less clarity there than it is on discussing um, the nature of what blood can do when it becomes stagnant or when it's deficient or something like that. The Chinese medicine literature is, is more complex and more thorough. And you might argue, I guess, that that's the nature of the practice because spiritual practitioners, they're up there meditating the mountain for 30 years, you know, they're, they're obviously dealing with less concrete concepts, whereas doctors, Chinese medical doctors, are working with people on a day-to-day -day basis on their body, physically, using needles and herbs and body work and all of these other things, all of the other modalities, weird Chinese medicine things where they set fire to their hands and pat you and all kinds of odd stuff. You know, but they're working with the body, so it's more concrete, it's more corporeal, so it's easier to write things with clarity about Chinese medicine, I think, or about something that's working on the body, that's working on the level of health. So this is a great strength of Chinese medical theory, for sure. But its downside is that it got crossed into the other arts. It filled in the blanks. It certainly filled in many blanks in Qigong. Um, they tried to use Chinese medical theory to fill in many blanks in Tai Chi, and that went wrong. They tried to use Chinese medical theory to fill in many blanks in Mbagua, or, and even Nadam, to a certain extent. There is a crossover between the models, of course. They still, especially with something like alchemy, Nadan, Qigong, Chinese medicine, they discuss the organs, the same um, sort of five elemental viscera, stuff like that. But the, the models are the same, and are not the same, sorry. The, the way that they're trying to understand the human being should not be the same. So here are some easy examples. Some easy examples. Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan, Tai Chi does not use the meridians. It just doesn't. It doesn't use the meridians. It doesn't use the lung meridian, uh, young channel, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't use the heart channel. It doesn't even really use the du and the ren. Not really. It doesn't, it doesn't use those channels. Not in the same way that Chinese medicine discusses them. Tai Chi does not really use the zhang fu, the organs, in the way that Chinese medicine does either. It doesn't even discuss the same kind of qi. The qi that we develop in Chinese medicine, we talk about Gu qi and Kong qi and Zhen qi and Wei qi, like different levels of energetic stratification within the body that, can, that govern the functional activities of the body with regards to health are not the same forms of qi that are developed in Tai Chi when we talk about something like sinking the qi or mobilizing the qi or filling the body with qi. They're not the same forms of qi as we talk about in Chinese medicine. So the models don't work. They just don't work. And certainly not the meridians, and certainly not in Bagua. I've seen books where they talk about the heart channel in Bagua and the lung channel. The lung channel? Yes, thumb channel. Thumb channel? Lung channel. Lung channel on the thumb. In Bagua and stuff. It's not how they work. It doesn't use those channels, those meridians. What these are are crossovers from Chinese medicine to these arts that shouldn't really have been there. But I understand it because if you have a gap in your literature, you have a gap in your concept, you have a gap in your model, you're going to attempt to fill that gap, complete that concept, fill that space with whatever you have. And because Chinese medical literature is so well established and its theory is so succinct and arguably easier to understand because it's very linear and process-based, it gets used to fill in those blanks, and I don't believe that's correct. And it's the same with alchemy and stuff as well. To a lesser extent, but it's also true for Qigong. For medical Qigong, I guess Chinese medical theory does match it to a certain extent, but I still argue, and this, <laughs> this might be a podcast for another day, because it's probably, it would take me too long to justify why. So right now, if you hear this and you disagree, I would say, that's okay, you can disagree, but Maybe mull it over and see if you can figure out why I'm going to say this. Is I don't believe that medical Qigong or Qigong in general or Neigong 
should use the organ channels from Chinese medicine. I don't believe it should use the lung or the heart or the small intestine or the bladder or the liver or whatever. Shouldn't use those channels in your Qigong practice. So when people are doing things and they're saying, I'm stretching my lung channel, I'm open my heart channel, it's not really how it works to me. It's not the same. Because again, the kind of qi that is developed in qigong is not the same as Chinese medicine. It doesn't mean that as the qi of qigong can build as a byproduct, it might assist the qigong, the, the, the qi that we talk about in Chinese medicine, but it's still not the same thing. Not exactly. So it's, as I say, maybe if that's a, if that's a big topic, I can do a, I could do an explanation sometime on the differences between the two if people wanted, specifically with medical Qigong and Chinese medicine, where the similarities and the differences are, because it is a big topic. But for now, just food for thought. Or just shout angrily at me in the comments. I don't mind. But where am I going with this? Yes. With regards to Chinese medical theory as a concept, I think it's very good to get people started but it becomes a problem with regards to spiritual practice. And I want to focus on one specific example, and that is the Shen. Now, why I choose the Shen as a, an example? If you don't know Shen, Shen means spirit, or well, that's what they translated it into English. But obviously, any translation is difficult, and um, spirit obviously has many, many connotations, everything from heavenly realms through to literal spirit, ghosts, you know, and something. But that's what they're discussing. With, with regards to Shen, they normally mean the divine, the divine part of your being, your spirit or connection to spirit, that which you want to unify with. So the Shen, is, as a term in Chinese medicine, is normally subdivided into five. Okay, So one of those would be the Shen, and then out of this we have these other parts of our, whatever you want to call it, our consciousness or our spirit, that interact with the Shen. Because all of Chinese medicine generally is about how things interplay and interact with one another. How do the organs interact? How do the channels interact? How does the qi and blood interact? There's always a relationship between them that forms the basis of Chinese medical theory. A lot of trying to help someone return to health is about harmonizing the relationships between things. Okay, maybe an oversimplification, but it's not a bad, it's not a bad understanding to have for Chinese medicine if you, if you don't have any idea about it. So the Shen, right, then has connection to these other aspects of your consciousness, would be the Hun, which would be the Yang aspect of your soul, the Po, which is the Yin aspect of your soul. So we have a Yang and a Yin aspect, okay, the Hun and the Po. Then we have the Yi, probably in the wrong order, but we have the Yi, which is uh, your, uh, it's a difficult one to translate, they say your awareness or your intention, I say your mental faculties, the movements of your mind, really, so your thinking, if you like. And then the last one, uh, the fifth one would be your jiu, which is translated as your willpower. And your willpower is not just your sort of physical drive to do something, um, but also it's connected very much to your idea of destiny or close to destiny, your ming, not quite the same, your ming and sort of fulfilling your life path and, and things like this. So there's a kind of drive to get things done in life. That's the jiu. So these things together, shen, spirit, hun, yang sou, po, yin sou, yi, uh, awareness or mental faculties, jiu, your drive or your willpower, your human will. These five things are considered um, the wu shen or the five aspects of spirit. So even though one of them is literally shen, called spirit, they talk about the wu shen meaning essentially that there's a relationship that spirit has with four other parts. They even put them in a model that matches the sort of five phases, if you know what that is, that funny diagram with five elements around the outside and a satanic pentagram in the, the middle, if you want to summon demons while doing your Chinese medicine. I'm sure you've seen that pattern. But the five spirits can be put into this model that shows essentially how they feed each other and how they control each other. It's like a big tensegrity network, if you like, of aspects of consciousness that are pulling and pushing against each other and producing each other to create balance and harmony. And different people will have different dominances towards different parts of their consciousness. For somebody the Shen might be strong, somebody the Shen might be weak, somebody the Shen might be unrooted, somebody their Hun might be out of control, it might travel too much, their Hun might be weak, their Po might be too dominant, their E might be scattered. You know, there's all these different things different parts of your mind. So a lot of the study of human psycho-spiritual, <laughs> I don't know what you call it, psycho-spiritual 
beingness, if you like, is understood. The health of the, of the person on a spiritual or mental being is understood through these five Shen. Now, these five Shen, they do have their place in alchemy. We do talk about the Hun, we do talk about the Po, we talk about the Yi, certainly, in Yan, we talk about the Zhe in spiritual context as well, but it's a little different from Chinese medicine. So, with regards to Chinese medicine, I always tell people that I'm teaching, when they first encounter the five spirits, is do not believe that they are something really divine and godlike and powerful. Because often when you read literature on the five spirits, that's the kind of idea you get. Not always, but they talk about it, it's like, here are the divine parts of you. The yang soul is a divine part of you. The po is a divine part of you. The zhe and the yi and the shen are divine parts of you. And you have all this massive spiritual divinity within you, which is the five spirits. So therefore, when you start studying the five spirits, which actually, after many months of studying points and damp, and wind and phlegm. It's quite nice to get to the spirits, actually. It's always a little bit of a reprieve when you're studying Chinese medicine when you get to this. But there, there's a kind of, there's a feel that if you are working on the level of those, if you're needling the body to work with these, or you're using herbs to anchor the shen, or whatever you're doing, then you're, you're working with the most divine part of a person's being. And I disagree. I think that the model of the five spirits is really a model of human spirituality or a model of human beingness when it is out of balance. So therefore, the five spirits are a model of human mind out of balance, not in their most divine state. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. If it was in a divine state, there wouldn't even be the five spirits. <laughs> That's my take on it. There would be two that would be quite dominant, actually, but I'll get to that. So again, it's not the study of wellness, it's not the study of divinity, to split hairs, the study of the five spirits is the study of when someone is mentally imbalanced. Now, again, might be unpopular, but I'm never, I don't see why, because I don't see wellness or not wellness as one being higher than the other, it's just a different way to look at it. But take it like this, right? The Shen, we talk about it being spirit, but it's a very inadequate word. It's very difficult. Shen means bloody everything. There's so many different types of Shen. And it is true that within some Chinese medical texts and some spiritual literature, they do create subdivisions of Shen. You have the Yuan Shen, um, you have the Shen Xian, and things, different types. Okay, but for now, if we just take Shen, that concept of spirit, is your Shen, well, we talk about Shen, if you're familiar with it, it's Chinese medicine, it's related to the fire element. It's rooted into the heart. It lives within the space in the heart, um, essentially. Um, it's reflected in the eyes and, and things like this, even though the eyes are also connected to the hun as well. But it, it's something we can see in the eyes. So we're talking very much about individual spirit. So if somebody has individual spirit, what we see is a glitter and a life in their eyes. Like we can tell the spirit of someone during a diagnostic process, but what the eyes are doing. Are the eyes darting around and can they not hold your eye in contact? That might indicate that the shen is actually unrooted, it would indicate a certain degree of possibly mania or something like this is causing the Shen to be disturbed. So we have all of these different concepts around the Shen. But of course, all of these are lending themselves to the idea that it is your Shen, my Shen, the patient's Shen. So therefore, if we're talking about spirit through Chinese medical terminology, what we're really talking about is individuated spirit. Now, this is where there's the difference between deep alchemical theory or deep spiritual theory and medical theory is that it's not really the individual Shen that we're interested in. What we're interested in is unification with Shen or unification with spirit. Let's forget the term Shen. <laughs> unification with the divine. And of course, different traditions will have different takes on that. Some will perhaps say that it is the heaven realms. Some may say it's God. But it doesn't matter. Whatever their term is, there is something that is a above or separate from the individual that we're trying to merge with or unify with. And what separates us from that within spiritual practice is essentially our individuality, that which we identify with that causes the illusion of separateness from others, also separates us from unification with the divine because we are sucked into this trap that we are separate. And of course, if we have Shen, if we have spirit, then that's another illusion of separation that we're caught in. We're identifying with an individuated thing. Now, one of the 
aspects of spirit, the individuated spirit as we talk about it within Chinese medicine, is the potential for connection to the divine, of course. So you could kind of argue with me there by saying, or disagree with me, saying that this Shen, because it has the potential to connect with the divine, it's not only individuated Shen, but it's also unified Shen. I would say that's true. I needed someone to argue with, don't I? <laughs> I'd say that. Or maybe I'll just turn and talk to myself different directions. I would say that's true, but generally in Chinese medicine, we're focusing on the individuated Shen, certainly during diagnostics, certainly during the way we discuss it. The language around it is very clear around this. Now, this Shen is then also in relationship with different parts of your consciousness, different parts of your being, the yang soul, the yin soul, just use the English terms, your awareness or your intellect and your willpower. Okay, so we've got four other aspects of your being that it's in communication with. Now, the very fact that it has an interrelationship with these other parts of your being, and they have a kind of, like I say, a tensegrity structure of relationship, if a set of scales could have five parts, it would be like that. Scales with five parts wouldn't really work, but they, but it, if they can interrelate in this way. Because they're interrelating, it means that it has a degree of separation. If it was unified spirit, it couldn't even have a relationship to these other things. It wouldn't be possible. So we're definitely discussing, to me, an individuated part of yourself. So it's kind of like your Shen, your spirit, when it's separated from the divine, rather than when you are divine. Yeah. Now the other things it talks about, your Hun, the Yang part of your soul. So the Yang part of your soul is the, the part that in Chinese medicine we talk about it, your planning and your dreaming, both dreaming in life, as in aspirations, but also your dreams at night as well, um, or one aspect of them, the kind of... The symbology comes from the realm of the soul, if you like, and then we interpret it during our sleep is one way of looking at it, these sort of hun messages that come through in your dreams. It's a very metaphorical and non-corporeal. It's the yang part of your soul. It's also the part of your being that would be involved in transmigration. To split hairs, they actually divide the hun up into three parts. They all do different things, but we'll, for now, for simplicity, we'll call it one thing, one hun. So this is definitely an individual part of you, because it is the part of you that carries on. Your hun works to a different time scale to your body, because your body is going to live, what, 70, 80, 90 years? If you have fun in life, maybe 60 years. Who knows? But you've got this temporary thing, demo, the experience of demo, that is how I see the world, that, that thing, that person, that identity of Damo that irritates many people out there. Don't worry if he irritates you because he's going to die. <laughs> it's a temporary thing and my experience of being Damo is going to end. But the idea is that the soul, the Hun, is going to continue past this. And because it is a continuing strata of karmic information, if you want, borrowing a word from another tradition, apologize there, then essentially it works to a different um, kind of time span. It's not looking at life in the same way. It doesn't view life in this temporary 80-year block, 100-year block, whatever you have. So the Hun, if it doesn't get what it wants, if it can't drive on, if it gets caught up in the mire of the illusion of this temporary life, then it becomes constrained. And constrained is the word, meaning the Hun is kind of throttled. It wants to dream. It knows it's here for infinite lives, for eternity, so it wants to go do cool things. But our mind and our body are here worrying about the fact that I've got to pay my mortgage and that this little bit of the Hun's journey is really, really important. So the Hun gets constrained and caught up and stagnant, and that's what starts to cause feelings of frustration or anger or one reason for it in Chinese medicine, right? So we have this other part of our being. But again, the way we're talking about it, it's individuated. It's still, it's us. It's an individuated part of us. It's certainly a deeper part of us, maybe a truer version of us, but it's still us. So now we have, within the model of the five spirits, what do we have? We've talked about the Shen, individuated Shen, the fire element. We've talked about Hun, the soul, individuated soul, your soul. The wood element, fire and wood element this is, right? So now we have two separate individual, and then you pour in whatever this drink is. It's non-alcoholic, by the way. Some of you got grumpy when me and Adam drunk uh, whiskey on a, a, a previous podcast, but this one's non-alcoholic. I just don't know what it is. Some kind of bizarre fruit juice. I don't know. It's the thing with living in Asia. You never quite know what you're consuming. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you've, you've got these two individual parts of you, individuated spirit, individuated soul. 
that are, have a relationship with one another, right? Fire and wood relate. These two parts here, they can be in flux. They can have a healthy relationship or an antagonistic relationship. But the very fact that they can relate to each other means they are separate things. If, they, if two things can relate, they are separate things, right? If, I, you know, if, <laughs> if the two things become one, they are single. One thing can't relate to anything else. It has to have something to relate to. So it's a devices devised, it's divided up. I don't know why I struggle with those words there. It's a divided up aspect of yourself. So already you are not in perfect union. The very fact that we talk about you having a spirit or a soul means you're not in perfect union. Then you've got the yin aspect of soul. I'll go through the other. I'll do them a bit quicker. Sorry, because this is supposed to be a Chinese medicine lesson specifically. You have the pole. The po, if you want to pronounce it exactly as you would in English, the P-O, po. So this is the yin part of your soul, the corporeal part of your, your soul, right? So the corporeal part of your soul, the yin part of your soul, is always depicted as a bit miserable. It's the element of metal, which is linked to grief. And it's the part of your soul that's actually going to break down when you do. So you a part of your soul that's more attached to your body. So the poor old po knows that it is also going to last for 80 years. And this is, or however, I don't, I'm obsessed, maybe I'll die at 80. I'm sort of cursing myself to die at that age, aren't I? But you know what I mean, like that length of time. So the Po is a part of your being that also very um, intimately connected to your attachments. Okay, The Po is often divided into a, a number of parts. Again, the seven Po. And these all have connection to different afflictions and different, um, what would you call it, mental attachments and things like this. Um, but it's okay, it doesn't matter. It's, it's enough to generally understand that it's connected to attachments. So it's a part of your soul that connects very much to your sense of identity, your sense of self. It's a part of your soul that erroneously also interacts with and identifies with mind. So it's definitely a very personal, individuated aspect to your soul, isn't it? It is only experiencing itself through the existence of you. And when you die, there's disagreements within the tradition or different ideas, whether it goes on to form a ghost or whether it turns into so much spiritual compost before it feeds into the next life. It doesn't matter. The, the essence of it is that it's only going to last for the length of your life. So the yin and the yang soul are going to separate at the point of death, and the hun is going to carry on with its merry journey of transmigration. So this idea of the po related to the element of metal and the emotion of grief the reason they're so intimately connected, those three, or particularly grief and the Po, is because when I read about grief in Chinese medicine, people often talk about it as though sort of your dog died, or your partner died, or your parents died, or, or something, you know, death. They were talking about literally death that's affecting the Po and causing you to become weak and maybe affecting your respiratory system that's also related to the Po. Okay, it's possible. It's true. Grief, unprocessed grief, can influence those parts of your being. Um, and weaken the, the yin soul, that's true. But to me, that's not the main thing the Po is grieving for because somebody that has never had any death in their life or no abandonment, maybe they're too young and they've had a, a lucky existence, blessed and had none of those problems, they can still have issues around grief, still have issues around the lungs, around the Po, around the element of metal because what they can lose is a loss of the sense of self because the yin soul is connecting or attached to sense of self. So if, for example, the example I always give, like, maybe you have a job, maybe it's your first job, and all of a sudden you're proud, oh, I got a job, I'm old enough to get a job. Wow, that's cool, and it's a good job, and this is my identity, and now I have importance. You've now developed an attachment to the job. You've become what we call in England a job's worth, but you're attached to the job, right? What happens all of a sudden if you get fired, or that company goes under, it disappears, that job is taken away, and the rug is pulled out from underneath your feet? This can produce the emotion of grief what we call grief, because what you have lost is your own sense of identity. Your self-identity has been lost because the job's been taken away. And this can happen on lots of levels. Maybe you'll lose wealth, maybe you lose status, maybe you lose position, maybe you are a spiritual practitioner, all of a sudden you develop an insight that's like, whoa, fuck, that's not who I thought I was. That tear from tearing myself from position A, who I thought I was, to shit, who I actually am, can create actually a sense of loss because you were previously very attached to that person. So grief can even arise as a, as a part of spiritual growth or natural evolution. So grief is a much looser term than just your cat got run over yesterday, you know? 
Apologies if anyone's cat did get run, run over yes, I didn't mean to trigger you. It's not very nice, and I'm sorry about your cat. So if the metal element is affected like this, the Po can be affected. So the yin soul can be impacted. Now, if it can be impacted, if the yin soul can be impacted on that level by the loss of a job, a loss of a cat, loss of a loved one, then of course it's an individuated part of you. That's not unified with the divine. Definitely not. It's you, separate. So then we have what? Je. Okay, let's do them brief. We don't need to do, <laughs> don't need to do them in detail. But well, that's your willpower. It's also connected to your Ming, which is a big topic, or your life path as well as your health. Um, your, so it's the fuel, if you want. Let's keep it really simple. The kind of fuel, it's connected to your kidneys and your essence, the element of water. Your fuel that drives you through life. So if we're looking at that, that's individual to you as well. Again, right? That's your willpower. That's your jur. I can't give my jur. Give my jur to that person. Have my jur. Because I can't. It's mine. They got their own. Well, they haven't got any. Most people haven't got any. So whatever. And then the last one is the E which is your awareness or your intellect, which I don't think of as an individual one, actually. To me, it's a composite of the others. I know that puts me in a, a minority with regards to how I talk about that. That's not the norm. But I see it actually as, a, as a, com a composite of the others. It's like how your awareness anchors the experience of the Shen's potential of divine, the Hun's potential to dream, plan, and structure things and connect to sort of life on a grander scale, the pose attachments and corporeality connection to the physical and to life, and the jur's willpower to drive and see things through, and also connection to your bloodline and your destiny. When all of those come together, what we do is we create the yi, the potential for the earth element, which often sits depicted in the middle of the other four elements in older versions of the five element chart. And it's essentially a composite. Your awareness or your intellect is made up of those other spirits in flux. And it creates the illusion, if you like, of an individuated part of you. Now, the funny thing is, that composite part, your intellect, your mind, your identity, is the part that we do identify with the most. So to me, the part of your Wu Shen, one of your five spirits that is the least existential, if you like, is the one that you believe has the most existence. Because we, we, our sense faculties are intimately connected to it. So this creates the ego and creates the mind. So we have these five parts, right? But they're all ours. They're individuated. They are separate things in flux, having a relationship with one another. The, 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 the Po can uh, cause imbalance in the Hun, and the, the Shen can cause imbalance in the Hun, and the Hun can feed the Shen, and the Jiu can become weak. They're all in flux. They're changing. So in there we have another quality of them. They are in flux. Our relationship to them is in flux. It is not permanent. My personalized, individuated Shen can come unrooted, become deficient. My Hun can bugger off <laughs> and wander. Within some old forms of esoteric medicine, we could talk about she losing your Hun or losing a part of your, your Po. So the idea is now these things can leave. The Je can definitely become depleted, that's for sure. So if they're in flux, they are not constant. And one of the other spiritual rules, if you like, is that if it is in flux, if it is subject to change, if it is subject to adjustment or the potential for imbalance, then it's not really the divine because it's not constant. Okay, It is something that is changeable. And all of these things that are changeable are also generally temporary or certainly our experiences of them are. So if we are talking about the five spirits, then really what we're talking about is definitely something that is not divine. What we're talking about is us doesn't mean we don't have the potential for divinity in us, of course, but that's not there. That's not what these spirits are. So I always tell people that I'm trying to teach medicine too, and certainly when they get to the psychology modules, is don't get caught up in thinking that the five spirits are talking about divine. What they're talking about is human beingness. The mind when it's fragmented, the spirit when it's fragmented, and our illusion of separation from the divine. That's what the five spirits are. Now, the five spirits module, when I teach it, is long. There's lots to it. It goes into all kinds of different things. Your filters of projections in life, your biases, your personality is massive. But hopefully this has given you a little bit of an understanding of at least how I view the five spirits, right or wrong. So this is a model transferred from Chinese medicine across to Taoist, 
practice, or you could argue from Taoism over to Chinese medicine if you want to. But I would argue that the version of the five spirits often talked about within Qigong or within Neidan, Neigong, within Tai Chi sometimes, if they're a weird esoteric school, when they talk about these five spirits here, they're normally talking about them on this level. So you have a kind of contradiction. It's almost like a little sort of an enigma there. There's a clash, isn't there? Because you're talking about five individuated things, but also propping them up to the level of the divine and discussing them in the same context as enlightenment or, or something. It's like a, they're talking about spirit or well, sometimes people within our chemical schools will talk about these aspects of spirit in the same way that other traditions will talk about unified spirit, like Brahmin or something like that. But of course, they're not the same thing. So to me, this is an example of Chinese medicine theory bleeding into the wrong context, you know? In the same way as if we talked about the divine, if I talked about the equivalent of Atman for, and, and, and Brahmin, for, if I talked about those kind of concepts in Chinese medicine, that would also be a crossing over of an inappropriate context because I'm not really trying to say I'm an acupuncturist. I'm not trying to needle my patient. They become enlightened. That would be a hell of a treatment and I would definitely charge a lot for it if you could do that. That'd be cool. I'd do it myself. But you are, talk, you are really concerned with at least getting to the state where they're mentally happily and comfortable and have a, an equal balance between all these individuated parts of themselves and parts of their being and parts of their spirit. But it's still not unified spirit. And the same in spiritual theory or meditation practice or meditation theory, whatever you want to call it. We want to step away from the individuated spirits towards unified spirit, which you might call Yuan Shen. But even that I don't think quite equates. Not quite. Not quite. Think of it like this. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon album cover. Okay? What have you got? You've got prism, right? You've got a white light that shines on that prism and it fragments into the colors that are on the album cover. I'm sure you've seen it. If not, you, if you're too young for Dark Side of the Moon, <laughs> you're probably not depressed enough. It's quite a miserable album. It's also a very good album, but if you're too young, you're sure you can type in Dark Side of the Moon and you'll see the, the prism and white light and, and you'll, you'll notice lots of um, influences who've never heard of Pink Floyd wear it on their t-shirt to be trendy for some reason. Mm. But that's me just sounding old. So, I think of it like this, like true unified spirit would be the white light that's hitting the prism. And the prism is you, your manifestation as a living being. And the fragmented lights that come out of that are the five spirits. So what happens is essentially, using that model, un like the divine unified spirit, when it experiences being you or it is refracted through you, creates the illusion of these various individuated spirits that include your yang soul, your yin soul, your spirit, your willpower, and your, the other one, intellect. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, just had to get up to uh, shut the curtain, uh, the windows, because you can't see where we are, but the podcast, oh, you can, it may be here on this wall. We're actually on the edge of a, a valley. The podcast studio is on a big valley out into the jungle, and then there the mosquitoes love the uh, pink lights. I left the window open one night, and I came back, the, <laughs> came back in later, and it was like a thousand moths all gathered around this light, so I have to be careful to keep it all shut up. Yes, what are we talking about? Oh, yes. So, the manifestation of you, the generation of you as an individual, causes the illusion of unified divinity to create these separate spirits. And this is what we're studying within Chinese medical theory. And this is also where I say the concepts become difficult because once you start trying to discuss or trying to understand or trying to teach, if you, if you want, the level of unifying with spirit, like um, higher aspects of spiritual practice, then the understandings of Shen, Han, Po, Zhe, Yi, and the other one, Shen, Han, Po, no, that is all of them. I nearly added a spirit. The understanding of those from a Chinese medical perspective becomes almost inadequate because they're almost at the level of psychology. They really are. And if they're not the level of psychology, they're at least at the level of psychological experience or sensory experience um, to varying degrees. Now, what we're trying to do through spiritual practice is essentially get those, we reverse dark side of the moon, flip the album cover over, 
um, <laughs> which is almost like playing it backwards here in satanic music or something, some panic everybody had in the 80s. But when those five lights come back together and converge back through the prism into white light, that's what we're trying to do. And white light's not a bad analogy because actually the sensory experience of passing into that threshold or across that threshold where the spirits come together uh, does produce the side effect or the phenomena of light, which is why white light is discussed so much. But even that is only at the peripheries of spiritual experience. It's not the be-all and end-all. It's just on the borderline of it, you know. So then at that stage, when we talk about Shen, we're talking about something else. We might still discuss soul, which has connections to Hun, but even then the idea of Hun is almost tainted or distorted a little bit by Chinese medical theory, because when we discuss Hun or soul, then really what we're doing is we're discussing it from the context of being experienced on an individuated level. But of course, in the case of spiritual practice, we're trying to rise above that or go deeper towards that, in, out, up, <laughs> whatever direction you want to put, in order to understand soul on a different level and spirit on a different level as well. So I don't think there's much more to say there, but I, I'm almost tempted to go into discussing those concepts, but I've rambled on my own long enough. No guests this week. I will have some guests soon. I've rambled enough. But really what, what I'm doing in what I was trying to explain here, and I kind of wandered around the subject a bit, and there was a few different concepts, and I, I rambled a little bit. It must be the unknown fruit juice that I'm drinking. It's just trying to show you that, that sometimes the models from Chinese medicine and Qigong and alchemy are a little different, something's biting me, and they don't quite match. Um, and we have to understand the right timing and placement and context for some of these conceptual models, and when they have their part to play and when they don't. And this is a part of our skill as cultivators, is to learn how to put things into the right context and know when is the right time for a conceptual model and when the right when it's not. I also might do this one because I write social media posts, um, normally over breakfast, actually. What I do is I sit there for breakfast and I type out my thoughts. Sometimes I look at them and I think, yeah, I agree with that. And sometimes I type them out, I post it, and then by the time I finish breakfast, I think, no, I don't agree with that, but I'll leave it up because it creates thought and it's entertaining for me and I, I also shared a nice photo. So every day I do something like that. It doesn't take me very long. They're not planned. They're a bit random. Um, and often when I discuss spirit or soul, it causes confusion because people will perceive me as a Taoist teacher or a Chinese medical practitioner or something and then they, they think I'm talking about soul or spirit from that context, but I'm not actually. Unless I specifically say Hun or Shen, I use the Chinese words, I'm actually talking about it from a different context of Chinese medicine. And I actually had some people ask me to explain or do a podcast or a talk explaining um, the differences with how I saw them. So hopefully that clears this up. But I'm aware that this is, a, a, this is my subjective experience of it. But I would also say that, that that's, the subjective experiences of these arts is all any of us ever can talk about. So I'm obviously not saying that this is a, an absolute. I'm really not. This is not an objective truth. This is just how I view it. This is my experience of finding my way, navigating my way through the, the path of studying the Chinese arts. But it might not be somebody else's experience. But it, do, like, if, if, if you hear this and you don't agree with it, just take it on board and, and think about it and use it for food for thought and maybe understand it or listening to these concepts or spending time with it will enable you to even develop more clarity on your own views because maybe you can counter view to what I'm saying and create a stronger thought process for, your, for yourself. What is not healthy is to instantly just go, no, fucking hate that guy, fuck that guy, all wrong. And I don't ever think you really, like you need to hear views that are different from your own especially if they're from someone that I think I have enough experience to have a view that might be different from yours. And if you take it on board and you can use it to work with, that's what all of this is about. This is what the learning process is. So I, I, I find it interesting when I, I do look at, not all, not all, I'm kind of busy, but I look at some of the feedback and I quite like the feedback. Um, it's nice people say it's useful, that's cool, that's nice to hear that. But I also like the feedback where people have a different concept of it and I look at it, I think that's cool, yeah, that's interesting and then I'll re-explain my point and there's a back and forth, that's cool. But it's really not helpful when you get comments, people just, no, you are fake, this is wrong, this is not what my master told, 
Like these aren't clever. Like as soon as I read those within the start of a line, I don't read the rest of the message because I know that that closed-mindedness means that there's no debate backwards and forwards. And I think that part of the, the beauty of these arts and of this era and of this time where we have all this communication and connection is that we're able to discuss these ideas and people are able to throw out different ideas into the ether, into the collective network of social media or the internet in general from all these different schools of thoughts and all these different backgrounds and all these different experiences. And then the, the practitioner or the cultivator can listen to all of these different experiences and then formulate their own concept, usually under the guidance of their teacher as well. And all, but all these closed-minded arguments are not helping. They're really not helping. So my advice would be, if you, li if you listened all the way through to here, you obviously have some kind of vested interest in listening to me. Either that you just like looking at the pink light, whatever, or my dog with his little ceremonial hat. But you like take it on board and think about it. And if it formulates, if you find, okay, there's some ideas in here that are helpful, that's great. But if these are ideas that just strengthen your own view, that's also great. That's also good as well. But do remember that almost any view that any of us holds are pretty subjective. There are personal experience formed over a period of time. And if you haven't done something for a period of time, probably your subjective experience holds less weight but if you've done something for a period of time, even if your subjective experience is very different from someone else, it still holds some validity with regards to the usefulness of discussing that experience, even if it's not the absolute truth. So I'll finish this drink and I'll finish this podcast here. Mm. I try and get a guest on next time, but I also have a series of controversial subjects I want to talk about on my own. So I'll do some of those. There'll be some with me, some with some other people. I've got some cool people to come and chat with, but uh, I'll also do some <laughs> controversial ones soon.